you don't have any authority over your neighbor's kid. You could say stuff about him, but you cannot go and tell him, hey, do this, do this, do this. It's out of your authority. It, an unbeliever is outside of God's territory, if you would, because he belongs to the kingdom of darkness. God cannot instruct. He may influence him. He may force him. He may take him out of the way like he did in the Old Testament. But he cannot guide him. He cannot teach him. Because a carnal mind cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So again, uh, no portion of the Scripture, out of the 660, 66 books of the Bible, no portion, not even a phrase, was given to an unbeliever for any kind of instruction unless those unbelievers sought God or sought the prophet of God in case of Naaman in the Old Testament and so on and so forth. But God cannot instruct a whole three books of the Bible. They say it's not written to believers. That is not only false doctrine, but that's uh, heresies. That's leading away from God's Word. That's eliminating one of the most important portion of the Scripture. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, John is writing to believers. The whole chapter, chapter 1, talks about believers and identify himself with believers. He says, we write unto you that we may have, so that you may know that we may, our joy may be complete, that your joy may be complete. So he's talking to believers. And of course, many verses there. Uh, so he says, if we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He couldn't be writing that to an unbeliever. An unbeliever cannot be cleansed from unrighteousness unless he believes first. Impossible. If people could be cleansed from their unrighteousness, we didn't need Jesus to die for us. Salvation would be meaningless. Again, what they're saying, it's eliminating so much of foundation of the Scripture and its dangers. So, uh, so Paul is really responding to these people. Uh, in that time, there were a group of people that believed that. Uh, there is a, a known poet by the name of uh, W.H. Auden, A-U-D-E-N, uh, he's uh, widely considered among probably the greatest literary figures of the 20th century. And uh, in his early 20s, he lived in uh, Berlin and had a, uh, uh, you know, kind of a very filthy lifestyle. And so he says, he says, I like committing, I like committing crimes. God likes forgiving them. Really, the world is admirably arranged. Uh, that's, that's these people say, well, if Jesus paid the price, like Muslims said to me, those, that Muslim said to me, and many Muslims say, they say, if Jesus paid the price, then we can continue sinning. Again, this is a misinterpretation of uh, the concept of grace. Jesus took our sin nature and crucified it on the cross, meaning sin and gave us, gave us a brand new life, gave us a new spirit. Sin cannot coexist with uh, this new life. You know, we were saved from sin or sinful nature or Adam nature as we've spoken in uh, details in chapter 5. So that sin nature is not in us anymore. What is in us is the life of God. He who is born of God, a believer is born of God, has the light. Jesus said, he who believes in me, I, he will have life. Zoe, God's life is in us. And so that life of God cannot coexist with a habitual uh, acting or practices of sin. John tells us this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. He says, whoever has been born of God, does not sin. Or that word means practice. It's a present tense. Practices as a lifestyle. For his seed, his seed, God's seed, remains in him. That's the life of God. And he cannot sin, cannot abide in sin, because he has been born of God. Now, this word here, let me go to our board. Uh, let's see here. Uh, 
let me get a uh, okay let's let's do this let get a f uh, fresh page the word uh practice or uh, here new king james says uh does not sin it's the word in greek po el it means to practice so he says it, that word uh, poiel, it, it, it's always a, speaks of a continuous action uh, of something that continuously a habitual practice. That's what he says. So he's not saying because believers sin, but they don't abide in it. They don't practice it as a habit. They do not continue in doing something. They know it's wrong and enjoy it and abide in it. Uh, ESV says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. West translation says, everyone who has been born of God, born out of God, with the present result that he is a born one of God, does not habitually do sin. Because his seed remains in him and he's not able to habitually sin because out of God he has been born with the present result that he's a born one of God. So it would be impossible for somebody who's born again abide, continue in his sin. I had a guy who, a uh, drug addict, you know, a lot of drug addicts that are getting saved and delivered through our network, Najat TV in Iran. And uh, this guy uh, got saved, and uh, he said, uh, when I got saved through the program, he put his hands on the TV, as I say, at the end of the, each program to pray. He prayed, and he didn't feel anything. He said, uh, I decided not to use drug anymore, because instantly he knew that using drugs is contrary to that new life that he's received. Isn't that amazing? Uh, there is no law against drugs in Islam. Uh, many of the ayatollahs in Iran are uh, opium addicts. Uh, they smoke it in their meetings. They smoke it in their homes. And opium is a major problem today in Iran because of these uh, Islamic uh, clerics in Iran, many of them of the government imported from Afghanistan and other parts. But this man... Uh, for 20-some years, he was a drug addict. He knew instantly. See, what was that in him that made it known to him that it was wrong? He's a spirit man. He's a spirit man had come alive in right relationship with God. And that spirit man judges every action that we take. We know instantly this is wrong or this is right. Every word that we say, we know it's wrong or right. Every situation we enter in, that spirit of God tells us that there is something wrong here. It's amazing. I don't reveal it much, but almost in, out of the 100%, almost 90 some percent of the time, when I walk into an area, I know what's going on in my spirit. I feel there's something wrong. If there's a strife going on, if there's division, I know in my spirit. And sometimes I don't understand my head on it and I'm wondering what's happening. Then later I discover what, this is why I, how I felt. Amazing how awaken our spirit man is to things that are right or wrong you meet somebody you don't know him from adam you never met this person but you know there's something wrong with this person there's something on the inside of you discovers it's led by the spirit of god your spirit man knows the truth that's why john says uh you have uh, anointing from above and you know the truth what is he talking about he talks about the spirit of us, our spirit man, the inner man, Paul mentions it. That inner man knows what is right, what is wrong. And in many cases, deeper even than that. So now, Paul says, shall we continue in sin? Uh, the word that Paul uses here in, uh, let's go back to our board here. The word that Paul uses, continue uh, or abide, it's the word epi. Meno, epimeno. It comes from two words, epi, which means upon, and meno, 
which means abide, uh, abide, or endure, or stay, or remain. Epi intensifies the meaning. So this word is a strengthened form of uh, strengthened form of meno and gives the force of adherence to and persistent in what is referred to. So it literally means to tarry, to abide, to stay with or add something, to abide in, to continue, to persist. Uh, Vine Dictionary says, epimeno indicates persistent persistence in what is referred to, which is in Romans chapter 6, verse 2. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So epimeno was used to describe someone abiding in someone's home as a guest with the idea of fellowship, cordial relationship, or uh, <clears throat> dependence or social intercourse. Uh, you can see it in several uh, Bible instances. Uh, Peter asking him, for instance, of the believers in Acts chapter 10, verse 48, the believers uh, ask him to stay there, epimeno, for a few days. Uh, we see this uh, uh, when Peter was uh, delivered from prison cell in Acts chapter 12 and, and, and comes to uh, uh, Mark's house, keep knocking on the door. The word continued knocking, that, that continued is the word epimeno, insisted. Uh, Paul and Barnabas urging a new converts to continue in the grace of God, Acts chapter 13, verse 43. Prior to that was Acts 12, 16. Uh, again, continue in the grace of God. Epimeno, uh, be, abide with it, stay with it, stay at it. Uh, be persistent. Uh, <clears throat> John Owens, a uh, great Puritan, P Puritan he used to say uh, that pastors have only two problems. <laughs> oh, I identify with this so much. He says, number one, persuading unbelievers they are under the dominion of sin. And number two, persuading believers they are not under the domain, dominion of sin. First, he has to persuade the unbelievers that, hey, you are a you are slave of sin. Sin is your master. Satan is your master. He's got to Get that message across. And then, to the believers, he got to get that message across that sin is no longer your master. Sin has no longer, as Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 18, dominion over you. Uh, that's not what most churches teach these days. They talk about the devil, the enemy. Most charismatic preacher, if you notice their preaching, most of their words is about the enemy attacking them. Enemy doing this, enemy doing that. And recently, a couple got saved and uh, got involved with an Iranian church, and the guy uh, got cancer. And the church where they attend, they told him it's because Satan is attacking you to hold you back your faith. This is all attack from Satan. It's like Jesus did all of that. He went through all of that in the cross, in the grave. He was accursed by God. He suffered for us pains of death in the Hades. And then he defeated Satan, all his co cohort there, down there after he became the righteousness of God. Then he was resurrected. And then he, was, he, he went on high, sent the Holy Spirit to support us, to help us, to aid us. And now we've received the Holy Spirit. Now he's going to let us be on our own. So that bunch of, uh, it's like giving birth to a child. And then right after that child is born, and you dress that child, put it outside so a bunch of thieves can come and abuse and mishandle that child. That's what they're exactly saying. It's like Jesus has absolutely done nothing to the demonic forces and, and, and the realm of Satan. Now we're all under attack. We're all under attack. It's all, the, the enemy is constantly attacking us. And we, we, have to, we have to suffer. We have to drag our tail through this. We got we to gotta make this happen. Oh, God, help us. Oh, would you pray for me? Would you? I'm going to fast. I'm going to, oh, I need victory. It's a spiritual warfare. Oh, God, help me. Uh, if it was not funny, I would say it's a joke. <laughs> but it is not. So, again, uh, <clears throat> so much of stuff is said and done and practiced because people just mimic what they hear 
and continue saying it without really searching the Scripture, say, is it really like this? Is this what the Scripture teaches us? And so on and so forth. So, again, uh, in the time of Paul, those who stuck with uh, the law, uh, they uh, taught that Paul's gospel of grace contradicts the law of Moses, the law of God. And so uh, they accused Paul, and we can see this in, uh, let's go to Romans, uh, let's see here, Romans chapter 3, verse 8. And why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, that condemnation is just. So some said about Paul that he uh, is saying that if we do good, uh, that if we sin, good will come out of it because grace will abound where there is sin abounds. So they said that's what say about us. So they accused Paul of promoting sin through preaching about the grace of Jesus Christ. And now... <clears throat> Uh, I know that as some are saying that about the teaching of grace today, of course, what a lot of people these days teach about grace is different than what Paul taught about grace. Like I said, you cannot teach about grace unless you understand the foundation of the redemption of Jesus. Otherwise, you will confuse people. And people will get on these little tangents like this group has about not confessing our sins when we commit sins. And, uh, you know, I was in Florida, and uh, there was a couple in our service, and that lady, she was so adamant about that I will not confess my sins. That First John chapter 1, verse 9 is not for a believer. And it really, no matter how many uh, verses of the Scripture I presented before, she was adamant about not listening. It's dangerous. Uh, that... That, that heres that's a heresy when people do not listen any longer and test the scripture just because they grew up in a Catholic church and they had to constantly confess their faith and they're tired of confession. That does not mean that you throw out baby with the bath water, the whole nine, nine yards, the whole thing, just because you had a bad experience in a, in a, Bad religion. You want to throw the whole thing out just because you had a, a, a rough time with confessing. So again, everything we hear these days, we have to bring it to the, I call it the court of, uh, to court of Paul. You know, Paul said, I've laid the foundation. Uh, and you can see this in the 14 letters he wrote if we... Uh, conclude that Hebrews is one of his books, which I believe it is. If that's the case, there are 14 letters of Paul's, 14 books. And Paul says, I've laid the foundation. So I believe the foundation for the entire scripture are in these 14 chapters, especially the book of Romans. So whatever you say, it has to fit. Number one, it has to fit Romans. It has to match Romans. And if it doesn't match Romans, then forget it. It's not going to match the rest of them. And the other books, whatever you say, it has to match these 14 books because the, these are the foundations as Paul says it. It is the gospel of grace. Paul says it actually in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Uh, now again, uh, there are, you know, there are those people, they call them antinomian, antinomian. Anti means against, nomian means, uh, nomos means law. So they are against the law. They are the type that uh, I, they have the philosophy, they say, I want to live the way I want to live, I'm free. They don't realize that freedom is not to do what you want to do. Freedom, Jesus said, him the Son sets free is free indeed. Freedom is God setting you free to do what He has ordained from the foundation of the world for you. That's freedom. That's real freedom. 
walking with God. That's freedom. Everything else is just a, it's a shadow and uh, it's, it's not the truth. Uh, Hampton Keithley, uh, I think he's the founder of uh, Bible.org. He says, since grace is at the very heart, indeed, it is the very foundation and fountain of true Christianity. We should have a better grasp of this important word and its truth. Furthermore, the doctrine of God's grace is in Christ is multi-sided. As a doctrine of the word, it touches every area of truth or doctrine in one way or another, which I believe. I believe Without grace, nothing is possible. Even it was the grace that caused, grace of God, that caused the law of Moses to be given to uh, the nation of Israel. He says, every aspect of doctrine is related to grace. It is no wonder grace is an important word and one that Paul desires to be experienced by all. It is a fountain from which we must all drink deeply. But it is one that runs counter to our own natural tendencies. Rather than drink from God's fountain, we tend to build our own broken cisterns. Cisterns like they did it in the time of Jeremiah. God said in Jeremiah chapter 2, He says, They have denied the fountain of life, God Himself. And they have built for themselves stinking cistern. Cistern was... I, they had them in the old days in Iran. They, they had a place like a tank on the ground in most homes to, for, a, for a water reservoir. They would, when the rain comes, they grab that water and pour it in that tank. It was built out of mud and, 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 and so on. And in those days, they didn't have plastic. They didn't have all these containers, you know. And they would keep that water in and that water would that water would turn into, uh, become stale and become stinking, and it would smell down there in, the, in, their, in their basement. And that's what God says. God says concerning Israel that they have denied me a, a fountain of fresh water, and they have built themselves their own stinking sister, <laughs> their, own, their own little ideology, their own little church, their own little, uh, this is the way it is, this this is the way we do it. This is the way we collect offering in our church. And it's been successful. We have built a massive facility with it. We're going to continue doing this. <laughs> and uh, not realizing that it's all because of Him. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though He was poor for your sakes, He became poor. Though He was rich for your sakes, He became poor. That you through His poverty might be rich or might be fully supplied. So everything we have, whether it's financial, whether it's blessings, whether uh, faith, whether whatever it is, it is not of us doing it, but of Him doing it. But our response is simple faith and accepting what He has done because in ourselves, we can do absolutely nothing. <laughs> That's a good news, actually. That's a, a deliberating news that it's not because of me. It's because of, it's not my giving. It's His giving. It's not my prayer. It's His intercession. It's not my faith. It is His faith was, even faith that was given to me. You have obtained like precious faith, Peter says, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, through the righteousness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Even the faith that some people brag about, that they got a lot of it, they got it from Him. How could you brag about something that you got from somebody else? As though you, you made it up. You read the Bible so much, now you got a great faith. When it comes to fasting, when it comes to prayer, when it comes to giving, when it comes to walking, when it comes to knowledge, everything is as a result of Him doing it, and we just respond to that. And that's called faith, and that is the foundation. Faith through His grace, through faith, that we receive everything from God. Father, we thank You. I don't see any, any <laughs>
question here. And so I assume this lesson was pretty much uh, understandable. And we thank God for you. And again, appreciate your support of supporting us, uh, the broadcast into the Middle East. Muslims are coming to the Lord. Radical Muslims are coming to the Lord. People are getting healed and delivered and saved. I'm, I'm getting so much tremendous email from Iran. Uh, these broadcasts that we're doing in, in Farsi, we put on Facebook, on Telegram, on streaming live. I mean, every platform there's out there, we're grabbing it and standing on it to proclaim the gospel. And again, we thank you for your support. We appreciate you. And again, click that button. At the bottom of this page on Facebook, say share. Share it on your site. Let other people see it. Lord, we pray in your holy name that uh, special grace may be given to all the people that watch this program. That we may understand, Father. That we may see this in Jesus' precious name. And I pray that your word may go forth mightily and prevail in the hearts of millions of people. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. We love you and we will see you next week here. Amen. For more of Pastor Reza's teachings and materials, please visit our website at www.rezasafra.com. Beloved of the Lord, what a tremendous time today. It's really the day of salvation. Tens of thousands of Muslims for the first time in the history of the church are coming to the Lord. We get so many calls every week on one hour program. Many are coming to the Lord. Many are getting healed and delivered. Those of you who are not a partner, I encourage you, please would you go to the phone and call that number on your screen and say, Pastor Razor, Brother Razor, Razor, I'd like to become a partner with you in reaching the Muslim world. There are so many cries going to heaven, and we need your help to make that a reality for millions of souls. Looking forward to hearing from you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.